nobody have thought renewable energy will have gone so far, you know, way back uh, 13 years ago. Today, it seems like everything is possible, you know, 100% renewable energy, that's what everybody wants. But way back many years ago, nobody would have thought that uh, renewable energy would one day dominate the world, right? <laughs> Very good morning and welcome to co to co This morning I'm with uh, Mr. Tam Chiuan, uh, owner and CEO of Ditronic Energy, uh, one of the largest clean energy providers in Malaysia and more importantly, one of the largest clean energy providers throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia. And it's very exciting. Um, Ditronic Energy is an SME but is committed to net zero and uh, is being validated by SBTI in September 2021 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. Now, just so everyone gets to know us, are you a morning or an evening person, Tom? I'm, I'm a, a, a morning person, I would say. Um, tea, coffee, chum? Coffee. How many cups of coffee would you have in a day? Uh, not too many, not, not more than two. Oh really? Yeah. So I can't have it all day. If if I have it all day, I will not be able to sleep. Uh, certainly before noon. Mm. <laughs> so I'm not a heavy coffee drinker, but so coffee what, better than. What tea. makes a good day? Uh, a good day is is a day where you know uh, everybody is is uh, we can see everybody's using uh, renewable energy, right? So so make the world much better. More importantly, tell us something that no one knows about yourself or not many people know about yourself. Not many people know about myself. That's a tough one. A lot of people know a lot of things about me. <laughs> That's all uh, right then. Probably I play football. So I played football when I was in, the, in secondary school and I, rep I represented the school. Hold on. Which, uh, which <laughs> position? I was in forward. Oh, uh, score goals or not? I score lots of goals. <laughs> As you are with your business. Now, let, let's get back to the topic at, at hand. Renewable energy is clearly the talk of the town today. But you embarked on this journey in 2009, some 13 odd years ago. Um, it was clearly not the talk of the town at that point in time. So what, what, what was the catalyst? What drew you to this field? So it was more of a technological uh, stuff and... What piqued my interest is one day my father showed me a, a solar cell with a fan attached to it and we put it under the sun and the fan turned by itself. So we have free energy by, by, by just putting the solar cell under the sun. So basically that, that actually created a, a big, big uh, impression to me that you know, energy could be generated in such way. So that got me interested. Uh, when I was in university, there was a course uh, renewable energy as well. So, so during that time again, it was the world is looking towards renewable energy. So that's why there was a course during the university days, and I, I took up the course, and it also kept my interest going. So when I was, uh, you know, trying to do something on my own in 2000, uh, 2018, at that time, so I, I naturally I, I I thought about going into solar. Right, so it it was it was very early days. There's nothing in the in the scene around the world. It's not an industry except for Europe in Germany. So it was very early days, and you couldn't find anything on the internet. If you want to search for anything, if you want to learn about solar, there's nothing. So basically, I learned about solar by by going through manuals, you know, instruction manuals, uh, catalogs of the European uh, manufacturers. Uh, that's that's how I, I I started and and projects are very rare in Malaysia. There's almost no projects at that time. So my first project was in Myanmar, yeah, not Malaysia. So I I managed to to put up a system, very small system, just two pieces of solar panel uh, for rural community, and and we started to install in in Myanmar. That's my first project, and then one thing after another, we got our first big project. Uh, to supply to India at that time. So it was a big deal for me. It was, uh, the contract was 300,000 US dollar. 
supplying 100 over units of a solar off-grid system to, to India. So basically, I, 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 it, was, it, was, it was a very good experience. So from there, we move on to countries like Indonesia, uh, Philippines, installing system. And in year 2011, uh, Malaysia government started to introduce some solar policy back home. So I shifted my focus back to Malaysia then and, and, and uh, we managed to be the pioneer of the fit-in tariff policy in Malaysia. So from there on, we, we write the growth of the industry ever since. So clearly, skill is important. Without that base of that, that technical base, in your mind, you have to be technically competent to embrace sustainability? Yeah, uh, of course, skill is important. Uh, you know, throughout the, the career, there are many skills that I've learned from when I started off as an engineer. I'm a trained electrical engineer, so I, I, I did electrical engineering work for a while when I first graduated. Uh, so that, that was my core expertise in engineering. So over years, as the business expanded, I have to you know, learn management skill, leadership skill, running a company. Every country has its own you know, cultural norms, have its own uh, political uh, you know, uh, environment. Because as an investor, we need to be aware especially when you are investing huge sum of money in, in a certain country, right? That, that's very important for us. So ESG skill, sustainability skill is something that I recently learned, right? For the, for, for the past couple of years. So it's another new types of skill that I have learned in my career. So it's definitely very important because uh, that is the trend, growing trend that, that is going towards sustainability and ESG. Uh, and this is something which I feel, in, especially in my field of business, we need to know that what our client wants, you know, we need to understand what are the, the driving factors and what are the, you know, the, all the requirements uh, to be a ESG company, so to speak. So that, that is uh, something that definitely is, is very important, especially in this day and this age. It all started with a cell and a fan, and then you took a course. Yeah. If you hadn't have taken the course, would we have Ditrolic today? I, I think we would not have the company today. Uh, so looking back, it was a, it was a long journey. I, I believe life is a lifelong journey, right? So you, you learn as you go along. You learn through experience, right? So, so throughout the years, you are, you are learning and learning and learning and and being involved in so many uh, value chain of renewable energy operating in so many countries. So obviously, you, it's, it's a long journey that you need to learn in order to, to become what, what we are doing today. Right? Uh, it's, it's a very complex business. We invest in many, many countries. Uh, not the easiest part of the world. Southeast Asia, very diverse culturally, economically. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting journey, I must, I must say. I mean, yeah, I, I think for, for us at the exchange, and we would love Ditrolic Energy to be listed, of course, when it meets your needs. Um, but um, I, I think the, the interesting thing, we, we, we focus a lot on, we, we talk a lot about ESG, but what, what resonates is the S part because you're creating new skills, new businesses, uh, engaging the community. Now, um, Ditrolic Energy has made a net zero commitment, 1.5 degrees C, aligned with SBTI. What was the motivation to take that step? Um, I think, first of all, we want to be a responsible business. We feel that, especially in our line of business, uh, we should walk the talk and we should demonstrate that business can be sustainable, can be compliant. Uh, doing, uh, making profit doesn't mean that we need to harm the environment. I think that's one of the uh, starting factor. But uh, I think one of the most important motivation or inspiration that we have is from our client. From the engagement that we have from our clients, 
uh, which, which is made up of a lot of large corporations. So we count a number of Fortune 500 companies as our, as our client. So these people, they, they have a very, very strict goals and very high motivation towards achieving uh, net zero carbon. Some of them as early as 2025. So throughout the years engaging with them, you know, we were really inspired by their action, you know, by their determination to achieve these kind of goals. You know, for us coming from Malaysia, maybe we think, you know, why this company are so persistent and so determined, right? Over years, we find that, you know, this, 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 these are the, the corporation and, and they are really driven by, by, by the requirement, you know, of the company, of the community, you know, that to, to, to achieve this kind of target. So their call to action yes. is shaping your philosophy. Yes. So, so as your philosophy has evolved, so yeah. can you share with us your, your roadmap for nitrotic energy moving forward? Yeah. Uh, we, we have, first of all, we are a SBTI, uh, science-based target initiative company. So that, that uh, we have set a target to be net uh, zero uh, by 2030. We have committed to achieve 50% reduction by 2030, but we want to try to go one step further to achieve net zero by 2030. So we are not a big emitter because of our line of business. We don't have any manufacturing plants and, and so on. But, uh, you know, there's, there's the, the, the scope three emission that we have to cover as well. Our stakeholder, our vendors, you know, all of them should be able to, to comply with the scope three emission by year 2030. Apart from that, we are also driven by uh, six SDG goals in our company. Uh, gender equality, um, we, we have uh, this uh, partnership for goal, industry innovation, uh, uh, climate action, affordable clean energy. So these are our six SDG goals. So we are very happy that uh, we are making good progress, good traction. In terms of gender equality, we we, 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 we target to achieve 30% gender equality in, in the management. Right. Today, I'm proud to say we are close to 50% already. Right. So if you walk around offices, you will see a lot of strong ladies, powerful ladies. Right. So, so that, you know, without counting, you can see that we, we have very good balance of uh, gender in our, in our company. Affordable clean energy. Uh, we target to achieve one gigawatt of uh, capacity uh, by 20, 2025 and five gigawatt of capacity by 2030. So that's what we plan to do for, for ourselves and our clients. So that's our, our affordable clean energy portion, providing clean energy in a very affordable way. Um, industry innovation. So we, we have to innovate the industry. So what we have done for the past year is we have introduced our program where we, we derive a 360 degree net zero solution for a customer where they can install solar, they can do energy storage, they can do energy efficiency with our company, they can buy green electricity through us. So basically it's a 360 degree uh, industry innovation. Mm. So it was one of the first in the, in the industry. So that's what we are committed to do. Uh, we also are committed towards responsible consumption in our business. So one example is in our, in our headquarter the building is net zero. So we, we produce more energy than we produce. We monitor our energy usage. We monitor our water usage as well. So we actually track it on a real-time basis at, at our headquarters. So that's, that's how we commit towards uh, responsible consumption. So um, we are also committed to partnership uh, for goals where we have to invest our investment in the most high impact way. So we have some sort of achieve, hit some milestone, uh, one of our investment in, in Bangladesh, where you know the impact of our investment have generated a huge uh, spin-off in terms of the, the social impact to the local community. So we are making good traction, good progress. So that, that's our, our, our roadmap, uh, so to speak, um, in, in, uh, in achieving our ESG goals. Clearly, um, it would be fair to say that 
ESG and climate change and carbon footprint have been an advantage for your business. Now, we engage many businesses and many SMEs see ESG as problematic. Um, but this is a challenge that you've clearly embraced and it, it's done, it's had tremendous results, both for yourselves as a business, but more importantly for the communities you impact. If you could share words of advice to our other CEOs about why they should embark on this journey. I see, personally, I see ESG as an investment, which then has dividends, because clearly if we don't generate sustainable profits, we don't have sustainable businesses. Your thoughts? Yeah. The ESG is definitely something that all business should consider. Um, yes, it's, it's a bit of a, a, a chore, you know, when you first started, because something additional that you have to do. But uh, as we embark on ESG, you know, you, you can see that uh, there's definitely a lot of advantage to do so. So first of all, you know, clients today, you know, stakeholder, you know, including our customers and clients, uh, demands that we are environmentally responsible in our business, you know, ESG driven. So, so first of all, that, that is the thing that we need to be aware of. So this is a new norm that we have to comply with all these things, right? So it will definitely help your business and help your product to have a greater reach. Uh, apart from that, if you are if you are a, a larger company or if you are not a if you are not a family business, you have other shareholders, other stakeholders, if you're a public company. So definitely ESG is very important to help you in terms of, you know responding to your, your, your shareholders' uh, requirement as well. So definitely this will help you in terms of your fundraising process. Even as an SME, right? even as a private company, you will also raise funds privately. So there is a growing requirement. Uh, you, you know better than me in terms of uh, ESG requirement in, in terms of a public company. But in, in, in private company, if you are raising private equity, uh, in our line of business, we have to raise money to build power plants. We need to install more system. Uh, we, need, we need capital. So in order to get a very good capital, very capital that's aligned to our business, we definitely need to align with their interests. And all of these kind of funds that is coming, these are ESG funds. So if we are not complying to their strict ESG standards, especially if the funds are coming from uh, Europe, from, from the US, we, there's no chance that you know, a business like us could, could be able to raise those kind of funding. So it's not much different from a public listed company. Uh, in fact, I would say it's, it's more focused and it could be more difficult because it's more, how to say, that the spotlight is on, on what, we, what we are doing in terms of ESG. I think uh, in summary, so ESG has provided an opportunity. It's also provided challenges, but it is something that we can all leverage to access greater markets, to access funding, um, and also be impactful about what we do. Now, you have an enviable, Mr. Tum, you have an enviable, Electronic Energy has an enviable client base. Uh, Educational institutions, aviation industry, as well as utilities. Um, how were these relationships created? Was did you go looking for them, or did they come looking for you? What was the cause <laughs> and effect? I think it's a very yeah. interesting piece. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we 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 most it goes both way, right? So we we search for clients that are big emitter of carbon or use a lot of electricity. So naturally, we, would, we are more inclined towards uh, big uh, you know, establishment like you know, uh, aviation sector, they emit a lot of carbon, everybody knows. Uh, you know, heavy manufacturing, they emit a lot of carbon. Uh, large you know, conglomerate, Fortune 500 companies, they have multiple manufacturing locations. Those people are also using a lot of electricity. Uh, university, very interestingly, you know, they run a big campus. They use 
huge amount of electricity because they run, you know, hundreds, in, in some instances, hundreds of buildings in one area, right? So they use a lot of, you know, air conditioning and stuff. So basically, those are people who naturally use a lot of electricity. So these are our top of the list client, that ideal client that we want. So we, we look for them uh, and we, we target uh, this kind of client uh, as our first priority. And sometimes they, they come to us because they know our profile. We have done this project. We have done, for example, we have done, uh, we have installed solar for Changi Airport uh, back in 2000, uh, 2016. So from there onwards, you know, our track record brought us to Malaysian Airport, where today we are installing solar across six uh, Malaysian airports in, in, in Malaysia. So basically, it's, it's, it's a relationship that we have built and, you know, it brings you know, one project after another, one refer to another, and, and actually it strengthens our client base from there onwards. Is there an education process? Say for Let's take a, a relationship, say Changi. They knew what they wanted and they came to you, or you sought them out and had a conversation and educated them about ESG, efficiency, etc. and so on? Yeah, it, it, takes, it takes a while. There's a bit of education process going on. Uh, uh, five, six years back, you know, nobody would imagine they want to install a big solar system on their roof. Uh, same for the airport as well. So it took us some time to tell them, they, they wanted to do a small test system. We tell them, why don't you go bigger so that it's, it's more impactful, you know, you get a better better deal out of it. So it, take, it took us almost a year, more than a year to educate, you know. So it's, it's the same journey that we had for most of the the companies that we have, the client. Um, how can businesses work together and leverage each other to reduce carbon footprint and more importantly, future-proof our businesses in your mind? So if you, if you look at carbon, um, more than 70% more than carbon is emitted from the energy sector. So these are well-known numbers, right? So for us, we feel that uh, the, the biggest and the lowest hanging fruit is actually energy when you talk about carbon. So uh, if we are able to decarbonize the, the, the energy sector, right, be it directly from your own operation, uh, from your rooftop by putting solar, by putting energy storage in your, in your business, you know, in some countries, energy storage is economically viable. For example, in Singapore and Philippines, so increasingly we are seeing people putting energy storage. Um, uh, so basically, uh, that's, that's one way, putting it on your rooftop uh, by reducing your on-site on energy consumption. And increasingly, we are looking at people buying electricity off-site. So something they can buy electricity uh, beyond their premise of operation. They can buy green tariff, they can commission a solar farm to generate electricity just for their business. So this is something, the trend that we see nowadays. So by, by doing that, uh, we work together uh, very closely, company like us, we can work together very closely with the industry, our client to be, to be carbon, uh, to reduce their carbon significantly because 75% is energy, right? So that's what we have to remember. And the rest is those uh, indirect emission from other processes. So we believe our business is in a prime position to help clients to reduce their carbon emission. If I can, I'd like to talk about Maimon Singh, the, the project in Bangladesh. It's a very interesting project which has, it's impactful. Of course, it's profitable for you. Um, can you share a little bit about the project and what's it, what has it meant to the local community as, as well as stabilizing the grid and those other matters? Maimon Singh is a, is, a, is a very interesting project for our company. Um, it's, a, it's a landmark project, I would say. Uh, something that we, had, we have developed since 2016. We, it, took us, uh, it took us four years to, to be able to commission the system. Throughout the journey, our company, myself and the whole company learned a lot. You know, something that you couldn't get in Malaysia. This, this project is, is in a, one of the least developed countries in the world. Where, where it's very challenging to, to, to develop a project and obviously infrastructure is lacking, their electricity access is, is uh, low. 
and stability of the grid is also, you know, is very unreliable. So when we manage to develop the project, we are bringing a lot of benefits to the community. When we have injected energy to the local grid, to the national grid, uh, the, the stability of the grid has greatly increased. Before this, there's a lot of brownout, there's a lot of uh, blackout in, uh, uh, in the grid during daytime where people go to school. There's a big university near my site. So you can imagine classes are interrupted, you know, uh, the religious school are interrupted. There's primary school over there. There's a lot of farmers during uh, planting, during the planting season, they are using water pumps where they couldn't pump the water because the grid is, you know, unreliable. So when we have commissioned the plant, the whole situation changed. The electricity have become very stable and there's hardly any brownout and electricity is stable throughout the days. So that gives tremendous uplifting to the community. And apart from that, we have also created a lot of job opportunity, right? During construction, we have created 1,500 jobs for the local community. We have benefited local contractors, local suppliers, uh, local, you know, uh, restaurants and, and stuff. Uh, during operation, we are, we are uh, directly and indirectly benefiting more than 100 people, which is employed by our plant as well. So it's a, it's a very interesting project. And also in terms of our benefit, our company, we have learned to develop, we have learned the ESG aspect five, six years ago. Because during that time, ESG was not a, it's not mainstream in, in, in Malaysia, right? During that time. But in a least developed country, we receive a lot of assistance from World Bank, especially ADB, you know, all the multilateral bank. They actually are subjected to many, many requirements, right? They are subjected to IFC performance standard when you develop a project. They are subjected to, you know, ADB requirement, many, many standards, which we don't see in Malaysia. So this includes your, your, all the SDG goals that you see, right? These are mainly derived also from the, the IFC performance standard. So that, that is also my personal experience throughout developing the project. Uh, so, it, so sustainability ESG is not something very new to me because during the course of the project, we have learned to comply with many standards that is required to build up a project uh, in, in, in those environments. So that's why the project is very interesting for us. What example would you like to set for communities and more importantly the younger generation or well, any i mean and ourselves as well yep i think the our business we are we are trying to set an example where business can be run responsibly we can make profit without damaging the environment not only our company any company can run their business without damaging the environment if they are conscious enough they go, they go on the right strategy. They are mindful of their, the impact of their action. So that's, that's what we are trying to set the example for the younger generation and remove the stigma of uh, large business is, is, is bad and damaging the environment, not necessarily so. So we are trying to change the mindset. We are trying to let everybody know that, especially the younger generation that, you know, we, could run a business in a good way. Well, thank you, Mr. Tum. I think in summary, if I may, mindfulness is important. We have to think about what we do and the impact of what we do. Ditrolic energy is walking the talk, if I may. And I think, if I may, to everyone who's watching, you have the opportunity to vote with your wallets. How you behave and what you buy sends clear messages to all of us in business. We can build sustainable businesses which are profitable for the future. Thank you, everyone.